was several weeks ago now that uh, Nathan and I finished part one of our series, so now we're finishing part twos. This is then part two of the Finding God uh, series. And the last time we talked about having the right mindset to develop a relationship with God, quieting our minds so that we could hear God realizing that God is not far away in some distant place, but that he actually lives inside us, and then making a conscious decision to pursue that relationship with our Heavenly Father. So today, I would like to look at some examples of practical things that we can do to better our relationship with Jesus Christ. So... Here's the word picture. You got out in the water over your head and the tide has kind of taken you out to sea and you can, you can stay afloat, you can tread water. So you're, you're doing okay out there, but you're starting to get tired. And you know you can't tread water forever and that eventually you're going to sink down to the bottom and drown. But you're doing your best, you're, hold, you're holding your own, and suddenly you see a lifeboat coming towards you. And you say, Woohoo, I'm saved. And then you watch the lifeboat as it floats past and starts drifting away from you again. And you just sit there and watch it go away. You wouldn't do that, would you? You would swim with all of your might to get to that lifeboat. You would grab hold of the gunnels and you would pull yourself up into the lifeboat. Well, that's what we're doing when we're pursuing a relationship with God. We don't just sit there and watch things happen. We pursue that relationship with our Heavenly Father. And the first way that we can do that, the first way that we can pursue God is to study God's word. And we've heard it said over and over again how important this book is, the Bible. The book of Hebrews has a really powerful statement about the Bible. In Hebrews 4.12 it says, For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts of and attitudes of the heart. You see, the Bible is way more than just a simple book. It is alive and active. The message we receive from studying God's word drives right into our very soul. And even though millions and millions of people have read the Bible, the Bible still has a message for each one of us personally. God has a message just for you. And you think, well, with all of those people that have read the Bible, how could God have a message just for me? But he does. Listen to God, God's words in Isaiah 55, 10 through 11. God is speaking through the prophet Isaiah, and he says, as the rain and snow come down from heaven and do not return to it without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater, so my word that goes out from my mouth will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. God's word has a purpose for you. And he says, my word is not going to come back to me empty. It's going to fulfill exactly the purpose for which I have sent it. Billy Graham says this, if you are ignorant of God's word, you will always be ignorant of God's will. We need to take the time to try to understand God's will in our life. If we want to have that intimate relationship with the God of the universe, we need to spend time in his word. 
you will find yourself drawing closer to the one who inspired that message. The second way that we can develop that relationship with our God is to seek out other Christians. Not long ago, I don't know if you remember, but we had a series of messages from Tito about all of the one another's in the Bible. Do you remember that? Well, you should because it went on for week after week after. Do you remember that? And I kept saying to myself, well, this must be the last one, but no, nope, there would be more. We had like over 30 messages about one another's in the Bible. And why are there so many of these one another messages? Because the idea of Christian fellowship is extremely important to God. In Matthew 18, 20, Jesus says this, For where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am in their midst. And this isn't just saying where two or three Christians happen to be standing around together. Jesus is specific here in saying where they have gathered in my name. See, when we come together in Jesus' name, we're coming together to pray, we're coming together to fellowship, we're coming together to worship him. That's coming together in Jesus' name. And when we do that, as brothers and sisters in Christ, he's in our midst, and that relationship continues to grow. That's when we start to accomplish the one another's when we come together. There's a saying that I saw online. It says, when a Christian shuns fellowship with other Christians, the devil smiles. When he stops studying the Bible, the devil laughs. When he stops praying, the devil shouts for joy. Let's not give him that chance. Let's continue to come together in Jesus' name and spur one another on to develop a closer relationship with God. Ecclesiastes 4.12 says, Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves, and a cord of three strands is not quickly broken. And that's true. When you put more than one strand together, that more than doubles the strength of it because both of them are working together. And it's the same for us as Christians. When we come together as Christians, we grow in our strength, in our faith, in our relationships. Every now and then someone will say to me, well, can't I be a Christian and not have to go to church? Can I still believe in God and not go to church? And I'll say, well, technically, yes, you can. But then I will always say this. You will never be the man or the woman that God intended you to be apart from the fellowship of other Christians. You just can't do it. You're not going to develop yourself. You're not going to hold yourself accountable. You're not going to always study God's word. But with our brothers and sisters in Christ, we're stronger than we are on our own. On our own. Do you want that kind of relationship with God? Well, you need the support of other Christians. So we've talked about studying God's word. We've talked about the fellowship of other Christians. And the third thing that I'd like to talk about this morning is investing yourself in God. And what do I mean by that? The question is, what am I investing myself into? You can have the best stock market tip in all the world, and I'll still tell you that it's a poor investment. Because unless your investment lasts into eternity, you're just wasting your time. We read it as we opened the service this morning, but this is... Matthew 6, 19 through 21, Jesus says, Do not store up for yourself treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourself treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Another way of saying that is, where you're invested 
that's where your heart is. And how do we invest ourselves? Well, we recently, uh, about a month or so ago, went through March Madness. And everybody goes crazy in March Madness, and they want their teams to do really well. But I just didn't even watch any games this year. Why? I wasn't invested in March Madness. You've heard him say he doesn't have skin in the game, or some people will say he doesn't have a dog in the hunt. Well, that's kind of what these games felt like for me. You know, if maybe the school that I went to had a team that was in the tournament, I might get excited about it because I was invested in that. If my kids were playing basketball and they were in the tournament, then I'd really be excited about it because I have more invested in it, right? Even if there was a local Cincinnati team in the tournament, which there just wasn't this year, maybe I would have had a little bit of interest. <coughs> but you can always tell the people who are excited about it, who are invested in the game, because it's all they talk about. They're always wearing the team jersey. They're always traveling to the games, right? Those are people invested in the game. And that's kind of the idea, what I'm talking about when I'm saying investing yourself in God. If we really want to invest ourselves in God, we need to do the same thing that they're doing. We invest our talk in God. God is part of our day-to-day -day conversations, is it? Sometimes... I can go several days and I think, when was the last time I brought up a conversation about God? Um, we do on Sunday mornings. We always come here and talk about him. But is he a part of our day-to-day -day lives? He needs to be. And kind of some ideas on, <coughs> on how you can find more ways to talk about God is in Bible studies, in the fellowships that we have up here at church. But you also need to have them with conversations with your neighbors and co-workers. We have some people in this church that are good examples of that. I always think about Jim Monning, because whenever Jim and I sit down and have a conversation, I try to talk about something, somehow he always turns the conversation around to Jesus. And did you testify to Jesus? Does somebody need to hear the word about Jesus? It's part of his everyday conversation. And I appreciate that, but sometimes it's frustrating too because I'm trying to talk about this and he wants to always turn the conversation to that. But he's a great example. And there's others too that you can follow that are great examples of how to bring that up. Um, another way that we can invest ourselves in God is to invest our time. When you start spending your time on something, you start to feel an ownership of that thing. I've never been really huge on taking care of my yard. That's never been very important to me. But as I spend time riding back and forth on my lawnmower, mowing the grass each and every week, it's become something <clears throat> that I care about a little bit more. I liked my yard to look nice as other people are driving past and see it. Why do I care about it now when I never did before? Well, I've invested time into it. I spend time taking care, not as much as Betty Jo does, but I spend some time taking care of the yard. And I'd like it to look nice. And it's the same thing with our Christian walk. If you would spend time up here at church, you know, whether it's on a specific project that you're working on or maybe a leadership role, you start to feel like you have invested yourself into this church here in, in Moores Hill and God's plan for this church up here at Moores Hill. You really begin to care more about the people who come here. You've invested your time and you want it to pay off. Well, the third thing that we can do to invest ourselves in God is to invest our treasure. Somehow, when people buy a jersey for a team 
or they buy season tickets, somehow they feel like they're now part of the team. They don't play for the team. They don't own the team. <coughs> they're not a coach. But they feel like I'm part of the team. They even get mad when the team loses. How could they let me down like that? Right? We do that with the Reds. What? <laughs> they're 3-18. How could, how could they let me down like that? I spent money on season tickets. When we spend our treasure on something, we really start to invest ourselves in it. And if you think about how much people spend on sporting events, you can kind of start to see how they go crazy about something because they're heavily invested. I have a question. Does God need our money? I used to think he did. I used to think, you know, if I don't give money to this church, it's probably going to fall apart and, and, you know, the church won't even exist anymore. But I was reading in Matthew 17, and Jesus was asked about paying the temple tax. And he says this, So that we may not cause offense, go to the lake, throw out your line, Take the first fish that you catch, open its mouth, and you will find a four drachma coin. Take it and give it to them to pay our temple taxes. So Peter does that. He goes out and he throws the line in, and sure enough, the first fish he catches has a coin in its mouth. Can you imagine being Peter and turning around and looking at Jesus and going, how did you, how, what, what just happened here? God doesn't need our money. If there's a need for money, he will make it appear. So then why do we give money to the church? I believe it's for my benefit. It's for each one of our benefits that we tithe. When you invest your money in God and his mission, you feel an ownership of that mission. And the relationship becomes more and more important. Whether it's tithing here at church or investing in another Christian charity, we are putting our money where our mouth is, and we become part of a greater team. You want to grow closer to God? Invest yourself in Him. Through our talk, through our time, and through our treasure, we develop a more personal relationship. We have skin in the game. We have a dog in the hunt now. The relationship we have with God doesn't fully mature the moment we come up out of the waters of baptism. It really is a lifetime journey. But if we want to grow and mature in that relationship, we need to pursue it. We need to study God's word. We need to seek out other Christians and we need to invest ourselves in God. Would you do me a favor? Would you focus on doing that in your life? And don't forget to encourage your brothers and sisters to do the same thing. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we have the opportunity not just to call you God, not just to call you Father or Savior, but to call you friend. And we pray that as we go through this Christian walk, that we will develop a closer and closer relationship with you. That we will invest ourselves in that relationship. That we will study your words so that we know your will. And we will join together with other Christians so that we might be encouraged to go even further. Heavenly Father, thank you for the time that we have had to come together to worship you this morning. We ask as each one of us goes our separate ways that you would stay with us this week. Let us keep you always in our words, always in our hearts as we go day to day. For these and all things we pray, in Jesus' name, and everybody said, Amen. Amen.